On today's pro program, we'll be busting the 5G myth. My guest today, William Webb, has been openly critical of the 5G vision. We'll also discuss a possible emerging new role for Wi-Fi. Join us right after this short break. Welcome back, everybody, to the first Wi-Fi Now, Now program, I should say, of this 2017 season. My name is Klaus Hatting, and I'm the host of Wi-Fi Now TV. This, of course, is the interview program that brings you all the great stories and not least all the great people from across the Wi-Fi industry. We're expanding a little bit today because we're going to bring in uh, a wireless veteran and expert in just a moment and talk a little bit broadly uh, about wireless, specifically 5G. Now, uh, we're actually going to kick this off, uh, this year off, by stirring things up. And uh, so we're going to do, actually today, a, an all at attack on the myth of 5G. And we're going to try to bust that myth right here on this show. So it's going to be exciting. My guest today is renowned scholar and wireless industry veteran, uh, Dr. William Webb. Uh, he is based in the UK and he's the author of numerous books, textbooks mostly on wireless technology. He's got a provocative view on why 5G may not be such a great idea after all. And in the context of that, because of course this is a Wi-Fi show, we're also going to discuss how a new uh, role for Wi-Fi may be emerging over the next couple of years. So that's uh, interesting for all you Wi-Fi passionate people out there, of course. Now, William Webb is coming up in just a second. Before that, I want to make sure that you know that we're taking Wi-Fi Now, the expo and conference at the great city of Washington, D.C. this April 18th to 20th. We were there last year and we had a great time, of course, in the U.S. Capitol. And we're going back to D.C. in about four months' time. And, well, we're already open for business, meaning you can already reserve your ticket. I very strongly suggest you go ahead and do that. It's going to be a great show. And if you're interested in exhibiting or uh, perhaps some other role at Wi-Fi Now, D.C., you better be quick because we are going to be filling up really fast. For this one, there's a lot of interesting developments in Wi-Fi, a lot of exciting developments, opportunities, and innovation in the pipeline. We're going to be covering all of that. So for all the details, go to wi fi nowevents.com slash USA. And if you have any questions, as usual, drop me a line at class at wi fi now events.com. Always happy to hear from the viewers. And that's my pitch for today. And without further ado, I'd like to welcome uh, William Webb to the show. And I actually... Before we bring William on, actually, hello, William. Just just come on and say hello. It's great to have you. Hi, Klaus. It's great to be on the show today. Thank you. Uh, thanks very much, William. I want to introduce you properly. And, and I have to say, you're probably one of the most accomplished individuals we've ever had on this show. So Thank you. Uh, Dr. William Webb, I guess doctor is the right title here, has worked for, uh, among others, Motorola, UK regulator, Ofcom. Right now, uh, William, you're the CEO of Weightless, uh, the Weightless Special Interest Group. You've, you've also written a litany of books on wireless communications, mm -hmm. a lot of really good ones there. And very recently, you've read the, uh, sorry, you've written the book, of course, uh, The 5G Myth, which is what we're going to talk about here. So mm -hmm. welcome to the show, uh, William. And that's cut straight to the chase. Can you give us uh, you know, the brief overview of why you believe the vision for 5G may actually be flawed. Yeah, sure. So what, of course, we're used to with every previous generation of cellular technology is that it comes along about every decade. And broadly, it delivers about 10 times faster speed than the previous one. And in essence, that's roughly what 5G is aiming to do. But sometimes these trends come to an end. And you know, I, I look at things like the, the Concorde airliner. Uh, now, if you drew a line through the speeds of airliners against decades, uh, up to the point when Concorde was introduced, you'll conclude that the next plane after Concorde would be going about 2,000 miles an hour in about 1990. But of course, we know that that didn't happen at all. Actually, the planes we fly now are really no faster than the planes from the 1950s. So sometimes these extrapolations come to an end when we've got sufficient speed. Uh, and that's my belief that broadly with 5G, we now have sufficient speed and that's not the key focus looking forwards. Right, exactly. There, I, I'm, I'm the same. I think there might be a natural limit to these things, exactly uh, this, this, the same concern uh, that you have, I think. So let's talk a little bit, let's break this down a little bit in, into some pieces here. Because um, first of all, of course, there's the technology part. So yeah. the, the tech vision for 5G, mm. and th there's a lot of things going on and being thrown around here. Yes. Do you think that any parts of that is even achievable? I mean, the 
con conceivably some parts, but there's a lot of things happening, right? Yeah, so I mean, almost anything is possible if you throw enough technology at it. So to some degree, it's a case of, is it economically viable? Uh, mm -hmm. But if we break down the kind of the three key elements of the promise for 5G, one is super fast speed, another is enormous capacity, and the third is very low latency, so almost zero delay. In terms of the speed, that's actually not too difficult. Broadly, speed is proportional to bandwidth. Throw broader bandwidth channels at the problem and you can go faster. So, so that one could be achieved. Um, but back to my earlier point, I'm not sure it's so important for end users with a mobile handset. The capacity side, though, is much harder. So in the past, we've got at more capacity through a mix of better technology, better spectrum efficiency, more spectrum and more cells we've kind of come to an end with a lot of those. So the technology efficiency is not really improving anymore. We've kind of bumped up against the, the theoretical limits. We are throwing a bit more spectrum at it, but proportionally it's not a very large element now of the overall spectrum mix that the cellular operators have got. So it doesn't have much. Mm -hmm. Small cells are getting very expensive and very difficult to deploy. So the only way ahead really here is to put in these millimeter wave small cells in city centers, which are tiny and very expensive. So you can do it, but the cost is huge. And then the third element, the latency, is just not possible, thank you. Right, and it's I was fun. also gonna, yeah, okay, sorry to interrupt. I was gonna ask you about the millimeter wave story because mm -hmm. if there's a mobility aspect, and presumably that there is a mobility aspect to 5G, this is something that has, uh, is very new. I mean, getting mobility, handoff, and so, so on, to work on, in millimeter wave bands is not an easy task, right? Not at all. So you know, if you just think of the, the, some of the problems, so to even get a halfway sensible range out of millimeter waves, the proponents are looking at very directional antennas to give you a beam that can go a bit further. Mm -hmm. But have to even find the mobile in the first place. So it comes into the cell. The only way you can find it is some kind of searching with your beam, which takes quite a few seconds by which time it's moved somewhere else anyway. Then when you've got it, it's then blocked by a bus or whatever. Uh, which means that the beam suddenly needs to be steered elsewhere. It's a really, really challenging task to do with mobile devices. Uh, and even if you manage to do all of that, you still don't get in-building coverage, which is actually where, of course, most of the people and most of the demand comes from. Yeah, yeah extremely challenging stuff, absolutely. So let's talk a little bit about market needs, and you've touched on that, I think, already to some extent. Uh, there are some sources, including yourself, that are, are saying that we are seeing the beginnings of saturation uh, yeah. in mobile traffic. So that's part of the story as well, right? I and mean, we're talking about inventing a new technology uh, and, and the cost of all that for how much more uh, traffic uh, uh, gain, so to speak, right? Exactly, so uh, many people say it's a bit heretical to claim that demand will ever level off. But actually, if you think about your mobile device, then by far the biggest source of use of data is video. And all the predictions from Cisco and others suggest that when we get to 2020, 80 to 90% of the demand is video related, and that's just going to become a higher percentage. And of course, there's only so much video you can watch as an individual, there's only 24 hours in a day, but actually you're not gonna watch very much on your handset, only when you're commuting or whatever. So we're going to reach a limit when people really haven't got the time or the inclination to watch any more video on their handset. And at that point, things naturally will tail off for the handset. The only question is whether we'll see demand appearing from other things like autonomous vehicles or whatever. But my view is that actually, because the, the key driver is video, all of those machines don't tend to send video, they send telematics kind of data. And that is a tiny, tiny amount. You know, I estimate it's about 0.03% of the load on the network from telematics data. So we could have a lot of those kind of devices. So yes, it does seem to me that as far as the mobile is concerned, we're heading towards some sort of a limit, perhaps to be reached in about 10 years' time. And not so true for the, the home and the office, because there are different dynamics there, but certainly for the mobile device. Mm -hmm. Right, and in, in one of the things that I've been trying to find out is uh, in addition to, you know, the demand for mobile data, of course, uh, consumed by human beings, there is, of course, the IoT piece, as you very elegantly said, a lot of IoT is actually, um, it doesn't consume data the same way as human beings do in terms of video. Stuff. But the other thing that I think is missing from the whole 5G story is what device, what uh, 
killer application will need this massive amount of speed. I don't think anybody's worked that out. And then people say AR or VR, but this is also very much in the early uh, stages. I can't find anything. Of course, 3G was and 4G was very much driven by uh, a data connectivity in various forms. And then later, of course, the iPhone and so on. But can you, can you find anything out there that to you would be the killer app for 5G? Massive oh. speed capacity? No, so not really. So, um, you know, you can imagine all sorts of wonderful things happening over the top, all sorts of new variants of Facebook and whatever um, that add great value, but they don't really need much more bandwidth or speed, so they don't need 5G. Um, mm. Things like augmented reality, possibly, but actually if you look at Pokemon Go, that only added 0.1% traffic load to the networks. So you can have an awful lot of those before you have any kind of heavy loading on the 4G network. Mm -hmm. Virtual reality, difficult to know for sure, but my take is that that's pretty much an indoor application. I can't see too many people walking down the streets with virtual reality headsets on. And if it's running indoors, then it's probably running over Wi-Fi, of course. Mm -hmm. So again, not clear. People sometimes talk about autonomous vehicles, but you know, my view is, yes, they need connectivity, but actually it's really just telling them about traffic patterns, what's going on around, but that's, again, a low level of information. So. At the moment, I can't see anything that requires something more than 4G. I'm sure there'll be wonderful new applications, but they'll run perfectly happily on what we've got at the moment. Mm -hmm. So, William, let's backtrack just a little bit to the economic side. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, my question to you is, is the, well, the way that I see it, let me put it this way. The way that I see it is that a lot of mobile carriers or, or, or uh, uh, fixed and mobile carriers are in kind of a long tail decline. It's flat. Yeah. Uh, to, to uh, slightly negative uh, growth rates, uh, basically right across the board, pretty much regardless of market. So the question is, uh, even if the 3GPP and everybody decides that they're going to, you know, standardize this new technology and 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 start developing it, will the carriers uh, uh, be prepared to spend billions of dollars on rolling out a 5G technology in their current financial state? I mean, I think this is a, this is a big should be a big concern, right? Absolutely, and you're spot on that revenues in the developed world have been in gentle decline for the past four or five years. And there's no sign whatsoever of that turning around. And of course, the, the competitive dynamics are such that um, there are a number of operators, it's hard for any one to raise their price because people go to a different one. And if they try and do it collectively, then it's going to encourage people to, to save by going to use things like Wi-Fi, where they can download stuff for free. So they may go for a, a smaller data bundle or at least not go for a bigger one. Uh, and, and do things elsewhere. So there's a lot of constraints that prevent the operators raising prices. And if they can't do that, then they're clearly not going to want to invest if they can help it, because that will bite into what profits they have left. So you already see a significant drop in their expenditure on 4G, and that's why we see companies like Ericsson and Nokia um, declaring reduced profits uh, over the last few years. And unless they can foresee some significant upside in revenues from 5G, it's difficult to understand why they put a lot of money into that. So mm -hmm. we're kind of in this chicken and egg where until we can see a good application for 5G, it's hard to invest in it. Uh, and as a result, nobody's really putting the, the work into finding the way ahead on that one. Right. So, I mean, one consequence of that is that some of these companies, and uh, you know, I've personally also said that I think a company like Ericsson honestly is in deep mm -hmm. trouble. And some of the other big ones might actually also be in trouble, given uh, that 5G is not here. We don't, you know, we don't exactly know what it's going to be good for, and all of that. And even if it does um, uh, turn out to be a great idea, then there's a couple of years still before uh, you know it might go mainstream. I mean, would you agree that these some of these companies are are, are in dire straits? Well, certainly, we've already seen a lot of companies um, consolidate split apart, you know, Motorola, for example, you mentioned I worked with them once, clearly was split into many parts that have all disappeared. We've seen um, Nortel um, and Alcatel and Siemens and also all get together with each other. We're seeing increasing competitive pressure all the time from the vendors in the Asia Pacific region, from Huawei and others. Uh, and you know, it does seem likely that unless something changes, that the market will continue to have to consolidate um, mm -hmm. Is merging or potentially dropping out of particular segments of the market. So, so you know, yes, unless unless they change their strategies, so yes. it does look to me like it's going to be tough times ahead for traditional suppliers to the city in the marketplace. 
Yeah, I, I very much agree with that. I, I, I don't uh, predict a very uh, positive future for, for many, especially the big uh, mobile vendors, of course. So uh, let's focus a little bit on Wi-Fi because this is a Wi-Fi show, so I want to get yeah. back to that. And uh, given uh, your view, which, by the way, I, I very much share um, on 5G, how do you see the role of Wi-Fi uh, growing or becoming more important, possibly, or not, in the coming years? Yeah, sure. So, so as well as setting out my critique of 5G in the book, I've also set out what I think would be a better alternative. And I've called that consistent connectivity. Mm -hmm. And it's the idea that actually, what would be better than super fast, super low latency in city centers would be the ability to, to watch video and to, to browse the web um, in a nice, successful fashion, wherever you are. So delivering sort of one to five megabits a second, at least everywhere. Uh, and that means, on trains, on buses, on planes, deep inside buildings, um, as well as in rural areas. Mm -hmm. That seems to me to be a much better goal to aim for, uh, and one that people I think would benefit from and would value. Mm -hmm. And my take is that, that all of those places, apart from rural areas, that Wi-Fi is a far better solution. So already trains tend to use Wi-Fi as their preferred mode of connectivity, planes clearly do, um, and we already have Wi-Fi inside buildings. And so, mm -hmm use of that mm -hmm. and put it on top of that to make a really seamless network where you can just wander around and you don't even know whether you're on cellular or wi-fi seems to me to be the way ahead and of course we're already seeing things like google project Pi mm -hmm. as a move in this particular direction and i think just building on that would be um, a really sensible approach for the next five to ten years at least mm -hmm. and there are a number of carriers out there that have been not everybody but have been reluctant uh, to use Wi-Fi for various reasons, technical yeah. and otherwise. Do you think that's going to come around? Will they have to face the music a little bit more now that maybe the 3G at the very least is a number of years away and in the interim something's got to happen, right? I think so. So you can, you can see why carriers in the past have seen it as a bit of a double-edged sword. So on the one hand, it's great it offloads traffic from their network, which makes their life a bit easier. On the other hand, it takes traffic away from them that they can neither bill for nor have any control over anymore. Uh, and, and they worry about that. Uh, and, and therefore you get you know, a raft of different strategies, some operators being reasonably happy to embrace it, others trying to avoid it as far as possible. Mm -hmm. But it seems to me that actually we're already now in a, in a world, a Wi-Fi first world, where Wi-Fi clearly carries the vast majority of the data, not just from your handset, but from your laptop mm -hmm. and everything else. And that makes it for operators to avoid. And I think mm -hmm. things like Project Phi will become a bit of a forcing function. Operators will look at that and say, you know what? If we don't do anything, then that will happen to us. Mm -hmm. Whereas if we start to take the initiative, maybe we can control our destiny a little more. And I think they, a number of them will start to look at better embracing Wi-Fi in the future. Mm -hmm. So, William, do you have any advice specifically to the Wi-Fi industry? Because, uh, of course, we've got a lot of viewers that are interested in that. And yeah. I personally think there's, you know, in this vacuum between 4G and any, you know, prospect of 5G, there's really big opportunity for the Wi-Fi industry. What, what do you suggest that people do in the interest? Sure. So, on the plus side, I think Wi-Fi has got great technology. It's got a great roadmap to, to higher data rates, to handling dense networks. Um, to using different frequency bands like YG, all that is, is superb and you know, I think really well handled. The downside right now is just the fact that so often you have to sign on to a new network with a password and so mm -hmm. on. And I know that there are many approaches that have been set out like Hotspot 2.0 and so on that in principle fix that, but it hasn't happened in practice. And I think making that really happen so that you can seamlessly roam across networks of hotspots provided by companies, individuals, operators, and others, you know, in a way that really works well, handles security well, is reliable and safe, mm -hmm. um, is what's needed at this point in time. And that may be more about organizational stuff than it is about any kind of technology. And that would be where I would suggest that the community could, could achieve the most in the next few years by focusing there. And I should say, actually, add to that, there are a lot of initiatives of that type. And, and uh, you know, in my small organization, we, you know, we try to do as much as we can to, 
to resolve those issues in their other organizations as well and, and so on. And, and I think we're seeing more cooperation. And I think that's a very, very good advice. Um, so William, let me ask you this last question because we talked about this just before you came on. Is it, are, are you shunned as a 5G skeptic with all the 5G talk going on out there? Because I, you know, I'm, I'm personally, uh, I wouldn't say I'm shunned, but I do get a lot of <laughs> flack back, thrown back at me. What's your situation on that? Sure. So, um, no, I was when I published this book, very unsure about how things were going to go. Yeah. Because as you already said, at the point in time it was published, um, there was huge amounts of hype about 5G and really nobody publicly saying that they had concerns about it. Mm -hmm. uh, but since I published it, and it's only been about six weeks, actually I've had a lot of feedback on places like LinkedIn and, and directly, which has been fairly supportive. And mm -hmm. it's kind of helped confirm my views that actually there were a lot of people out there who shared my concerns but for various reasons, didn't want to be the first to stick their head above the parapet. Um, but now that I've done that, I are able to effectively point to that and say, you know what, there's some good stuff in there. So it's only days yet, um, but I think it might just act as a, a point where people can crystallize around and have a sensible discussion about what might be a better way ahead. And I'm sure I haven't got it exactly right, but if I can just encourage the community to step back from all the hype and actually start to look at what's sensible, what might really happen and where the best way ahead is, then that would be a fantastic outcome. No, I think so as well. And, and I'm totally with you on that. There should be an open debate about these things. And, and it, it does bother me a great deal when, when the enormous, by the way, mobile industry simply decides this is the way it's going to be uh, and not have a debate about these very fundamental and, and things, you know, technology that's critical for the future generally of the planet, right? So we, we need to do that. And I commend you for doing that, by the way, William. This, it's great to have you on the show. Thank you very much. So uh, I, th I think that's, that's it. We're out of time. But I want to thank you for coming on. And by the way, if we can do it, I think we'll try to uh, put up a link to your book. I is it a free download book? I think it is, isn't it? No, it's not actually. So oh, it's, it's, not. It's, it's on Amazon. It's available okay. as a book for a... Uh, um, a Kindle, you can get a free download of the conclusions chapter. Oh, right. Okay. And, right. and that's available from my, from my personal website. So I okay. can send you the links to that. Okay, sure. We'll see if we can put a link into that because I think it's important. It's a super important discussion. And uh, William, it's great to have you here. And please come back and see us again. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Kath. All right, everybody. That's it for this week's show. The first uh, show, I should say, of 2017. And uh, the good news, of course, is we've got lots more great uh, guests coming up in the coming weeks and months. So have a great week, and I will see you next week. Actually, the week after I'm traveling next week. Thanks for watching, and uh, come back again. Wi-Fi Now is a production of RCR TV News. To suggest a show topic or to learn more about Wi-Fi Now events, you can reach Klaus Heading at klaus at headingconsulting.com. To find out more about Wi-Fi Now and all things wireless, visit rcrwireless.com.